بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا حبيب إله رب العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المزلومين سيما بقية الله العازم بقية الله خير لكم من كنتم مؤمنين ولعنة الدائم على آدائهم وغاسب حقوقهم ومنكر فدائلهم ومناقبهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيامهم الدين اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and أسعد الله أيامكم Greetings and felicitations upon the birth of Qamar ibn Hashim Hazrat Abul Fadl Abbas alayhi salam The Bab al uh, the door of our prayers where they are answered Welcome to our program uh, We will be trying uh, looking at the personality of uh, Abul Fadl Abbas in our program and uh, we have with us Hujjatul Islam wal Muslimin, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Hanif, and uh, welcome, Sheikh. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And we will be uh, looking at this personality, this great personality, and particularly, um, I would be uh, interested in knowing uh, because uh, of you, as you have converted and you have heard about Abu Fazl Abbas from before, and how his personality really. Uh, kind of attracted you or did you know about his personality before or maybe later on you found out about him and you read about him and what do you think of and how uh, you know his personality will be something that we need to take lesson from uh, particularly in uh, the contemporary society that we live in. Bismillah mm -hmm. uh, rahim First of all I'd like to uh, congratulate all the you will be the viewers uh, on this occasion uh, of the birth of Hazrat uh, Abbas uh, <coughs> salam. and um, I think that's a very important question um, what can we learn from Hazrat Abbas and um, some things stick out more than others I think one thing that most Muslims are aware of most Shia Muslims are aware of is um, his uh, role in serving the Imam. Um, uh, Hazrat Abbas uh, displays the uh, spiritual path of service. Uh, there are many different spiritual paths. I think the, the, uh, the, the three major um, spiritual paths are the one of, um, of contemplation, which is the path of the mystics. Um, the uh, path of uh, absolute obedience in terms of ob being ob obeying the Sharia and uh, also the path of service, the path where you, you serve humanity and you serve your brothers and sisters. And indeed, of course, in the Imams and, uh, and in the Ahlul Bayt in general, alayhim salam, all of these paths are uh, expressed in the most... Um, you know, exalted way, and um, and they are found in their r proper expression in the imams and the members of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. And so you'd find, for example, that Imam Ali alayhi salam was a contemplative as um, well as a fastidious um, practitioner of uh, the Sharia and also that he was of utmost service to the Muslim community in many, many areas, even to the point of uh, distributing food to the poor and so forth at night when nobody can see. Um, Hazrat Abbas uh, 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 illustrates this beautiful path of service. Um, we see this in um, his absolute obedience to the Imam, being the servant of the Imam in the most exalted sense of the word. Um, and we also see this in terms of his, um, his role and his desire to provide water for the, star, for the thirsty children in, in the camp. Um, and I think there's a lot, of, a lot that we can learn 
from there. You know, people ask, you know, how can I arrive at a high level of spiritual awareness? Well, this is one aspect of arriving at a high level of spiritual awareness. Perceiving the needs of people in your community in, in, in your community in uh, the narrow sense and in community in the general sense and providing as much as one can for their welfare. Yeah. Let me give you a couple of things here which I, uh, you know, uh, kind of reflected upon. Uh, that is, there is a special relationship with Hazrat Abbas and the Imam of the time, mm. you know, uh, because, you know, it's been mentioned that whenever there is the zikr, the remembrance of Abu Fazl Abbas, particularly in regards to the tragedy of Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam, the presence of the 12th Imam is there, mm. right? So now, uh, you know, uh, we have the role models for example, within the you know Islamic history, and the greatest of all is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where the Quran it itself points out to that he is the uswa, mm -hmm. you know he is the role model, uswatul hasana. Fourteen masumins, but when it comes to Abu Fazl Abbas, he is outside the you know the uh, the the sort of daire, you know the parameters or the designated masumin, which mm -hmm. are fourteen masumin. Yes. So it's it, it makes it more of a uh, uh, you know of a greater model role model for us being not a masoom you know that to really uh, take lesson from him and as you rightly pointed out to where it's the it's the uh, you know is the surrender to the will of the imam to the imam of mm -hmm. the time where it is clearly reflected uh, the. The reason uh, I, I, I uh, you know, I brought that Imam Zaman and also Abu Fazl is because we have to be loyal to the Imam of the time, mm. and we want to be loyal the same way as Abu Fazl Abbas alayhi salam was loyal to the Imam of his time. Mm. So we have to take lesson from Abu Fazl Abbas and surrender the Imam in the same fashion. Now, one thing that. Uh, reflects in the life of Abu Fazl Abbas uh, is right from the very beginning the aspect of his training and tarbiyat right? from the historical point of view as we all know that Amirul Mu'mineen did not marry after the shahadat of Hazrat Fatima to Zahra alayha salam for 10 years so he did not get married after 10 years Abu al-Fazl Amir al wanted to have a child who is strong, courageous and who could really in a way represent him mm. because we see that uh, Amir al Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam always mentioned that Abbas you're my son mm -hmm. and Hussein is the son of Fatima you know you will represent me on the day of judgment right a Abbas will represent Ali on the day of judgment so here Amir al muminin said to his, you know, Aqil, Hazrat Aqil, you know, uh, his brother, that I would like to have a son who is courageous and strong. Then this name came up of Hazrat Fatima. Her name was Fatima as well, who was Umul Bani. And then after 10 years, you know, of the Shahadat of Hazrat Fatima to Zahra, Salamu Alaiha, Amir al muminin gets married to Hazrat Umul Bani. You know, that's her title uh, because she gave four sons. Mm -hmm. To uh, Hazrat Ali. Now, when Hazrat Abbas was still growing up, there is this incident reported. So, we want to look at the Marifati aspect. You know why Hazrat Abbas was so much, sort of, you know, self-sacrificing, surrendering to the Imam. And then I want you to reflect a bit on the Marifat uh, aspect and how important you know the knowledge and understanding, the Irfani and the Marifati aspect is. Imam Ali was teaching Hazrat Abbas, you know, how a father teaches their children. Says Abbas, say one, you know, say for example, Wahid. You know, you teach yeah, numbers to yeah, their children, yeah. one, two, three. Right. Know. So Imam Ali said, Abbas, say Wahid. Say the Wahid. You know, Hazrat Abbas said, he was still very young, you know, learning how to speak. Then Abbas, say Ithnain, say two. And he replies by saying, Father, 
the mouth that utters one doesn't look nice to utter two. Mm. Right. You know, this sort of Tawheedi understanding of Hazrat Abbas, that he knows that, that oneness, that Tawheed is one. That a mouth that utters one does not look to utter mm -hmm. twice, two. Right? So if a person have that marifat of Tawheed, that understanding of Tawheed, then only he will be understand what wilayat is. Because there's mm. a relationship of imamat and wilayat mm. with Tawheed. Right. right. So I just want to, you know, uh, you know, discuss a bit more on mm. this marifati mm. aspect. If you can shed some light, <coughs> it would be great. I think um, uh, marifa uh, occurs uh, in different situations. You know, for example, on the uh, average level, like ourselves, for example, we ask, how do we get marifa? You know, and and getting marifa is involved with things like tazkiyatun nafs and uh, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and doing uh, you know the extra acts of worship and so forth and so on salatul lail and so forth and these things lead towards ma'rifa right um, you know fighting the war against the nafs for example is a very important way of getting ma'rifa and then there's another way of getting ma'rifa um, or, or in this case I would rather say having ma'rifa you know, and this is based upon, for want of a better word, your spiritual genealogy. You know, that if two very spiritual people um, have children, you know, it's quite likely that one or more of those children will be born with Ma'rifa because of the spiritual capacity or status of these two people, you know. When we, when we look at Hazrat Abbas, we uh, see that even from a very small age, um, you know, I guess one can say at an age where, for example, uh, he's not capable of sophisticated cognition on a deliberate level, for example, on an educated level and whatnot. He's making statements and, 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 and taking positions and so forth that indicate that he has ma'rifa, you know. Um, you know, I, I, you mentioned something like, you know, they were, they were outside. He was outside of the 14 Ma'asumin. But um, he is not unusual in this respect. For example, Hazrat Zainab al-Kubra, yes. you yes. know, As-salamu alayhi alayhi yeah. You know, she was also um, outside of that 14 Ma'asumin. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, you know, but she is also known to be the person who was taught by a non-human teacher. Yeah, definitely. You see? Yeah. Um, we have Hazrat, Ma have Hazrat Ma'asuma in Qom, mm -hmm. who is called Ma'asuma, <clears throat> you know. Um, and, and, and what they do, they, they, their position, it is almost indistinguishable yes. from the others of yeah, the 14 Ma'asumin. The, the, the reason I kind of pointed out to that 14 Ma'asumin and, the, you know, now the Billah, you know, there's nothing of disrespect mm. that they of are course. not Ma'asum. They are Ma'asum yes. in yes. that sense. In that designated sense, mm. they are 14. But, you know, when you look at these powerful personalities, you know, who reach to the level of Kamal and yes. perfection. Where, for example, Hazrat Zainab or Hazrat Abbas, you know, particular to Hazrat Zainab, they say you could read Ziyarat al Kabira mm. for her, mm. which is addressed to, you know, Masumi, yes. you know, right? So obviously their, their status and their level and their maqam is to that level mm. of Kamal. Mm. Although they were not in that, you know, category of considered being as a masum as they say of that course. you know their personalities are so shining mm. you, know, uh, you know usually they tend to joke you know take this one of the imams out because they, are, they don't know much about imam mm. al-hadi alayhi salam or imam al-naqi mm. alayhi salam or imam al-taqi alayhi salam because abu al-fazl is is like a you know amazing yes. uh, you know person uh, even among the uh, you know um, riwayat that mm. we have that you know, oh, Abba, uh, Uncle Abbas, for example, they say that he has a, a status, a lofty station, that all of the shohada will envy him. Mm. You know, kepte, mm. you know, will envy his maqam. Mm. You know, Abu al-Fadl Abbas is given the wings in paradise by which he could fly, mm. very similar to Jafar Tayyar, mm. for example. Well, you know, this is not mentioned in regards to other shohada, mm. but particularly to Hazrat Jafar al mm. and Abu al-Fazl Abbas, right. having wings, for example, yes. which is very symbolic in terms of that 
flight, uh, that sort of flight of him, of them towards Tawheed, mm. towards that maqam, you know. So, I mean, uh, that's the reason. So, like, like as you said, yes, there are, there are these personalities which kind of becomes a very powerful, uh, uh, you know, uh, pull of, uh, of us towards, of, hum mm. you know, humanity towards mm. them. I think, you know, I mean, uh, it, uh, there, there are many accounts that even though they testify and acknowledge the spiritual uh, eminence of the 14 Ma'asumin, at the same time, they uh, establish some kind of connection um, or, or, or approach to their level, in, if one can say this. Um, in other hadith, for example, you know, they have a hadith where, for example, uh, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi says, Salman al-Farsi is a member of my Ahl bayt Yes. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, in another one, he said, Abu Dhar is a member of my Ahlul Bayt. Yes. Okay. I even heard one that said Bilal was a member of the Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. And then you have a hadith that talk about, for example, the, that, 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 that um, symbolize the Ahlul Bayt as a tree, you know, and as the, the leaves of that tree, which are part of that tree, um, being the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt. You see? So this opens up for us exactly. to really go in that direction. Exactly. You know? So while at the same time, the Ma'asumin represent a special spiritual status, um, it is almost like Tashkik. It mm -hmm. is a graded type of uh, spiritual, spiritual status that we can approach in terms of um, sharing that light by our own efforts, you know, where we become much more of a, of a representative of that Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as, as you kind of pointed out to in aspects of the, the Ma'rifati aspect, Taskiyatun Nafs, you know, to really go in that direction, that Tawheed, that Taskiyatun Nafs. You know, the aspect of Tawassul, mm -hmm. you know, intercession. And this taking role model itself is one of the uh, manifestation or reflection of Tawassul itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. take them as a role model right. and through them, you know, you reach towards, you know, God, yeah. towards Ahl Bayt alayhi salam, yeah. right? But I think also they help you, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think they're also there to help you, right? you know, and this is why we call upon them for help, mm -hmm. you know, not, uh, you know, but I think for many ordinary people, they think of help just, you know, to deal with the distresses of life, for example, no. you know, but they are also there to help us raise, you know, a level in of our marifa, marifa. Yes. raise in our spirituality and so forth as well. Right. You reminded me of a, of a saying or of an incident which was reported by Sayyid Ali Qazi Tabatabai, mm. who was the Ustad of Allama Tabatabai. Mm. Uh, he says that, as we know, this great personality, Sayyid Ali Qazi, who was a mountain of Tawheed, mm. according to Allama Tabatabai. And, uh, you know, he was one of those who have achieved the levels of Tawheed that you know no one have really could have imagined mm. you know according to many scholars who have said uh, now he says that uh, he was doing this taskia purification of the soul and immense practice of the sharia uh, of islam and eventually he wasn't really reaching that maqam mm. to have that vision that mukashifa to really see you know so as it was the practice of the ulama from Najaf to go to Karbala for ziyarat, so he goes on a trip to ziyarat to Karbala, and there was this man who was known as a madman. You know, like usually mm. they are in the place of ziyarat, mm. you know, yes. a person like crazy going, speaking, saying things. Mm. And, and uh, he says that when Agai Qazi, almost Maghrib time, mm. he went to the door of Abul Fazl Abbas, as we know that one of the title of Hazrat Abul Fazl Abbas is Babul Hawaij. You know, the door of, you know, desires, right? Mm. The door where all the desires of mm. people are answered. So he goes there and he says that this madman who was moving and saying things, he says that the door towards Tawheed, the Qutb, mm. you know, 
of this is Abu al fast mm -hmm. You know, the pivotal point of Tawheed mm -hmm. is Abu al fast mm -hmm. So uh, Sayyid Ali Qazi says that, well, this man may have heard some terminology in the lesson and he's coming and talking about Qutb and this mm -hmm. and that and Irfan. Maybe he said something. But as soon as he went inside the haram of Abu al-Fas, it was, he prayed his nawafil, and it was Maghrib prayer, with that tawassul he did to Abu al-Fas, and he said, Takbiratul Ihram, and then Sayyid Qazi says, Alam ye alam dige bood. Mm. The whole alam, the whole world changed mm. after that. And then there is his statement. He says that Kaabe, mm. no, Makkah, the mm. Kaaba, mm. of Awliya is Abu al-Fas. Mm. You know, Kaaba, yeah. which is the, you know, of Awliya, uh -huh. is Abu al-Fas. Now, who is saying this is Sayyid Ali Qazi. Mm. Someone who is fully aware the value of Kaaba. Mm. Someone who is fully aware of the value of Awliya. Mm. So the Awliya, they go around Abu al-Fas mm. in order to reach Allah. Mm. So Abu al-Fas becomes that. Right. So that, uh, as you mentioned rightly, you know, the help and aid is not necessarily, you know, you know, we hear, you know, karamat, you know, a person got shifa, he was given, you know, you know, issues, problems, but the greater of these karamat and help and aid is the aid of marifat. Yes. You know, is that sort of. So that's why you have fascinating rivayat. It says, someone who recites, uh, I think 313 times. Ya kashif al karb an wajh al Hussein, ikshif karbi bihaq aqiq al Hussein. You know, 313 times mm -hmm. a person who recite this, ya kashif al karb. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is tawassul to Allah. Mm -hmm. You know, kashif, kashif al karb yes. is God. Yes. Ya kashif al karb an wajh al Hussein. You know, those, the one who get rid of these difficulties and sorrows and you know, problems from the face of Hussein. Ikshif karbi. You know, get rid of mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. sorrows. Bihaqqe mm -hmm. aqiq al Hussein. Mm -hmm. For the sake of aqiq al Hussein, Abu al Fazl yeah. Abbas. So, I mean, you're right in terms mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. well, I'm just thinking uh, when you're speaking, just to make, to clarify some things to some people who might make, uh, come to the wrong conclusions about let the, the idea that the Kaaba of the Awliya is Abu al-Fazl. You know, um, the uneducated mind or the unfamiliar mind might see this as, a, as an associ as associationism or a kind of shirk or something of that nature. And just to, uh, I think, like, you know, to, to clarify that to people, because we've, there are many hadith that, that, that say things of a similar nature. You know, for example, you know, a certain du'a or, 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 or ziyara or whatever, you know, is equivalent to, you know, so many times you use hajj and so forth and yes. so on. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, I think first of all, you know, we have to separate the, the, the fact that, um, you know, uh, one is a, uh, a shari'i obligation, right, that has a, has a particular status on that particular level, you know? Like, for example, prayer, having a shari obligation. And however, we have hadith that say, for example, the seeking of knowledge is greater than that of prayer, for example. It does not mean to say that one should abandon prayer and replace that with the seeking of knowledge. You see right. what I mean? Right. What yeah. it is talking about is basically um, equivalences in, 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 in spiritual uh, blessings, you know, that, that is equivalent to, for example, prayer, but does not necessarily replace it. At the same time, I think the same thing was, it applies to the idea of um, Abu al-Fadl being the, 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 the Kaaba of the Awliya, in the sense that without Abu al-Fadl, the Awliya, without the, 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 the focus on Abu al-Fadl as an example, yeah. you know, as a prototype, the Awliya cannot ascend, exactly. yeah. you yeah. know. And so therefore, uh, just as our focus on Kabbalah, uh, sorry, on, on, on the Kaaba, is a is a prerequisite for ascension to God. Definitely, yes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Similarly, Abu al-Fadl is a is a prerequisite for the spiritual ascent right, to God for the Awliya. Yeah, yeah and, and I mean we look at, for example, you know, the heart of a moment is the house of God. Right. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes I feel like you know just to tell them, you know, you know, like you know, 
لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلِيَّ You know, you have your understanding of whatever. You know, let us do what we are doing. You know, Abu al-Faz is the Kaabe awliya, no matter what you understand. I don't care. You know what I mean? You know, when it comes to like, for example, this hadith, the heart of a Muslim or a Mu'min is the house of God. Yes. Do not break the house. Right. Everybody say, oh, mashallah, mashallah, very good. But when it comes to Ahl Bayt, mm. when it comes to Abu al-Faz, they say, oh, this may be, I don't know, it doesn't look nice. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you have. That's exactly right, right. but it requires that clarification, right. you know, for the people. And not only in terms of the maqam hai manavi, if you look at his physical sort of reality of Abu al-Faz, they say that, uh, you know, he was about 12, between 12 and 14 years of age. Mm -hmm. And he participated in the battles with Hazrat Ali alayhi salam, mm -hmm. you know, Siffin, you know, which is one of the famous event uh, that is reported in regards to him, they say that he was veiled, you know, he veiled himself, you know, niqab. And then he cut through the, you know, ranks of the enemies as he was fighting with in the Battle of Siffin. And they all thought, people who were looking at him and his chivalry, you know, mm. his sort of art of war, mm. you know, which there were different categories of this, you know, way people fought battle like for example they would go cut right inside and they will fight from inside to get rid of the lashkar or of the enemies right sometimes you fight face to face right so there were different arts and one of them was famous Hazrat Ali alayhi salam would perform you know which has been pointed out to in uh, Surah Adiyat wal Adiyat Dabha which God says that by the sparks of the hooves of the horses that marched and sort of attacked the enemies where the Prophet had sent Amirul Mu'minin to fight the enemies, right? In which he entered and then he fought from inside, you know. So Abu al-Faz went and cut the enemies, you know, and fought from inside. Everybody says Amirul Mu'minin mm. here. But finally when he unveils himself, it was this 14-year-old child, a boy, you know, Abu al-Fazl Abbas. Mm. So, in terms of that physical sort of, you know, sh courage, chivalry, that's why he's given that banner. You know, he's known as the, you know, Leva. He's given that mm. sort of the flag, standard bearer. This, yeah, standard mm. bearer of Imam mm. Hussein alayhi mm. salam. So, he becomes that sort of strong. And as a matter of fact, you know, as we're talking about these personalities, they have reached that level of Kamal and perfection. They are the role models. They are not like, there is no male and female once they mm. become role mm. model. Mm. Rasulullah is role right. model for females mm. as well. Hazrat Siddiqa Kubra Fatima Tu Zahra mm. is role model for men as well. Mm. Not that she's Hazrat right. Zainab Kubra the same way. Abu al-Faz is the same way. Mm. So, I mean, it, can you kind of reflect in terms of some of those things we were discussing earlier yeah, well, in regards know, to Abu al-Faz being that role model, standard bearer yeah. in the contemporary period for our youth, for yes. our sisters, for our brothers? Well, I think it's a great idea that you brought that up because um, one of the things that I say a lot about Hazrat Abu al-Faz um, with respect to women, you know, I think that um, sort of counterintuitive, one would expect, for example, a warrior you know, who wields the sword and f is in the thick of the battle and so on would be, an, would be an inspiration and an example for men and not for women. But I think Hazrat Abbas uh, is most important for women today. And one of the reasons for this is because when we ask ourselves what serves as the standard, you know, or the flag of Islam today, what what do people see? What physical symbol do people see in the Islamic community um, that makes people aware that Islam is a presence in, a, a, in an alien environment? And that is hijab. You know, and um, hijab, therefore, acts as the flag of Islam. And uh, we know that when we talk about things like the practice of Islamophobia and harassment of Muslims and so forth, we know that uh, Muslim hijabis get the brunt 
of these types of things. So when you want to know where the war is being waged, you just look at where the hijabis are, and you can see the war being waged. You know, and I think, uh, incidentally, I think, you know, because today uh, is the 3rd of April, and uh, you have this awful letter being circulated around in terms of oppressing Muslims, you know, and it talks about taking the, um, the scarf off of a hijabi and throwing acid in Muslims' faces and so forth and so on. You know, I would encourage the Muslim brothers to keep an eye out for the hijabi sisters, regardless of whether they know them or not. You know, that if you're on the street, for example, and you say hijabi sister, you know, you act as her, her knight. You know, you'd be ready to come to her rescue if somebody wants to harass her and so forth. Well, um, you know, I think sisters can learn from Hazrat Abbas because they, they carry that particular flag. And, uh, you know, when you, when you, when you re re uh, research uh, and investigate what it takes to be a standard bearer, you know, the standard bearer is the strongest person in that, in the, in that particular military detachment. You know, the standard bearer has more experience in fighting. You know, the standard bearer is trained in fighting. You know, and I ask uh, many parents, you know, when, you, when your daughter reaches the age for wearing hijab, have you sufficiently trained her to be able to defend herself and to defend others? Have you trained her to be able to speak out and to defend herself verbally and intellectually about Islam? Have you trained her to be able to react when somebody uh, 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 accosts her uh, physically, you know, um, or do you leave her to go and go trembling in a corner? You see what I mean? And it gives us an indication as to what we should do with our sisters. You know, so I think uh, Hazrat Abbas is like this. You know, his Hazrat Abbas is a very, very good uh, example for sisters, as well as for brothers, but especially for sisters in this day and age, because uh, they wear that flag of Islam upon their heads. Right. Right. Interestingly, I was just, uh, you know, uh, reflecting on what you have just mentioned, uh, that, you know, sisters are representing that. They are, you know, just like how Abul Fazl Abbas was the standard bearer. You know, he was representing the, the strength, you know, of, you know, of the troops of Imam Hussein, mm. alayhi salam. And uh, the same way as he becomes the example for the sisters and for the brothers, mm. for all of us as well, is that you know how a Muslim should be mm. you know that as the Rivayat says in the traditions that you know a Muslim a Shia a follower of Ahl Bayt is well known mm. if he is working in a company if he's working in a school if he's going attending a university by his Akhlaq mm. you know by his you know by being a, a true follower of Ahl Bayt so now once again that aspect of Abu al being that role model you know for all lovers of Ahl Bayt mm. that you know Ab Hazrat Abbas salam, was like this to the Imam mm. of the time mm. was like this to the Imam and, 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 and here like as we mentioned earlier in regards to the tarbiyat of Amir al muminin the Marifati aspect you have a greater role played by the mother as well you know Hazrat Umm al -Banin. Right. They say that when Hazrat Amul Banin was about to enter the house of Amirul Mu'mineen, they say, you know, Imam Hassan Imam Hussain was ill a bit and because she went there and she says that I am entering this house as a slave for the children of Fatima. Mm -hmm. Because she also had that marifat, mm -hmm. that understanding of who Fatima right. was, Salamullah Alayha, and who Imam is. So, and she always trained the children that you are the servants of Vilayat. This is the household of Nabuwat. This is the household of, of Vilayat. So even mothers also have an aspect of tarbiyat mm. that we should really, we all should, including myself, and uh, you know, in terms of training our children, reminding them of the courage of Abul Fazl Abbas and how strong he was, how strong a supporter he was. To, uh, to his brother, to his deen. You know, like for example, the poetry that mm -hmm. is recited on the day of Ashura, where he went to fetch water. Uh, if you cut my you know, left hand, I will support with the right. Mm -hmm. If you cut my right hand, I will support with you know, myself. You know, I will be the supporter of this deen, you know, of this religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know. 
So uh, the the aspect of tarbiyat of parents uh, is is quite important. You know? Very much. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially in this society, um, uh, we should we ne we need to be aware of the the importance of this, especially when we are so busy. You know, where you're living in society in a society where it's very difficult to maintain a household in a major city like London with on one income, for example. You know. Uh, what you find is, um, among a lot of people, uh, they do not have time to do tarbiyah of their children. You know, um, they they in the non-Muslim environment they depend upon the teachers to do tarbiyah of their children. So teachers tend to take a parental function in their relationship with their children, and I think because children actually become traumatized in schools, you know. Children become more confused about the identity in schools, right? Not to mention gender identity, you know, but all kinds of identities that they are offered, you know. Um, uh, it is not surprising that when uh, dysfunctional people want to take their frustrations and anger out on society, you find many of these shooters in America target schools. You ask, nobody has asked the question, why do they target schools? You know, why do they target a police station? You know, why do they target maybe a social services agency? You know, why don't they just target their parents? Why do they have to go to a school and target a school? You see, I think it is because of the trauma that they have, uh, have, have, have experienced in schools. And our Muslim kids, you know, if they are not trained properly, if they are not strengthened properly, um, would also be traumatized, even more so, in the, in the school system. I think a time is coming, or the time is here right now, for us to be healthily uh, 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 distrustful of the school system and strive to es establish parallel school systems, you know, or even a, a, a high level of a high level quality of homeschooling, for example, to save our children from this spiritual and, uh, and, and cultural emptiness and lack of hope and, and cynicism and, and, and sarcasm and so forth and, and, and unnecessary questioning of one's identity, you know, uh, to save them from that, for them to be able to for, perform a much more productive and positive role in society. Definitely. Now, the same thing, you know, is, is the aspect of the tarbiyat and where, you know, we look at the personality of Hazrat Abu al-Fazl Abbas, we talk about his courage, how strong he was and apparently there's a narration which says that um, majority of the time on the ninth night uh, before Ashura, the tenth of Ashura, the Umar, is, Umar is Saad and his team were mostly discussing how to really defend or how to fight Abu al-Fazl Abbas if he come to the battle. Mm. Because he was renowned, mm. he was well known, I mean, for his sort of chivalry, for his strength. And, but now the, the, this is seen that he wasn't apparently given the permission to really fight the battle, but rather to fetch some water for the camp of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. But he surrendered to the will or whatever the desire of the Imam was although being so courageous and he wasn't really allowed to engage so sometimes you know it is not that Zahiri outward sort of fighting and courage but there's something internal as well you know well, I think I mean? in that situation uh, you have a, 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 a primary cause and a secondary cause you know, the primary cause for him going onto the battlefield is to get the water for the children. The secondary cause is, 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 is he can fight his way to the water yes, and definitely. fight his yeah. way away from the water. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So the fighting is still there. Yeah. You yeah. see, but the primary aspect is the service. Yeah, is the service. Is the yeah. service. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, service to the Imam. Yes. And to whatever the Imam have desired. Exactly. Right. And also, uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about him not engaging in you know, quenching his thirst uh, when he reaches the Euphrates. Yes. 
Well, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of work being done right now in the area of psychology talking about empathy, the importance of empathy in, in, in communication, in, 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 in sharing people's suffering, you know. Um, and uh, we find this in, in all aspects of the lives of the, uh, the lives of the uh, al -Bayt, alayhim salam. You know, we find that, for example, you know, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi slept on a very simple bed, you know, and lived like the poor people. We find Imam Ali alayhi salam, for example, living like the poor people, you know. Um, even later on with the other later Imams, you know, we find that uh, you had a very interesting juxta juxtaposition of uh, a bit of luxury and also asceticism the luxury for their wives because this is what maybe they were used to and their own um, way of life. Sure. You sure. see? And so if I... Public, for example, rip, you know, being in, in, in public like the, the hadith of 60 mom who was wearing very... Very nice sort of clothes nice in public clothes, and so on. But inside yes. he was wearing yeah. something of yes. soof, like yes. woolen and stuff. Yeah, e yeah mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, so, you, so, you, so you have these... Um, these uh, uh, traditions taking place. So here he is at the water, and the, it, it shows us how you how he is very much um, aware of the nafs. Okay, aware of the nafs. Okay, and that the nafs is what it is. It is what it is. Huh? Your body is thirsty. You see water. You have access to water. You be get you get tunnel vision. <laughs> you think of nothing else but drinking that water. This is what your nafs is. It's not a, it's neither, neither bad or good. In fact, it's good. You know because your 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 need for this thing, your physical need for this thing, you know, narrows your concentration upon the thing that you need to get, and you get it. If he drank that water, he wouldn't have been committing any sin. All right, but. What Islam tells us is that our intellect should always be dominant over our nafs. You know, so he gets to the water, he dips his hand in the water, right? And he thinks. And at, in that moment of thinking, he begins to empathize. My master hasn't drunk any water. The little children haven't drunk any water. So therefore, nafs, you have no right to ask for water or to go for water until they are, they are quenched. And he throws the water back. How beautiful it can be. And what it indicates with us, it tells us, for example, consciousness, to be conscious of oneself at every moment, you know, especially at moments when we are moving to satisfy our nafs. You know, where we have to say, um, not only is this halal or haram, I think that's one of the uh, places where we are kind of becoming very weak. Mm -hmm. And I always emphasize and I will, you know, remind our viewers once again and remind myself as well to really remember this important reality. And that is the reality of adab. Mm -hmm. You know, adab, you know, that sort of, what do you call that, adab? Manners. You know, manners, yes. right? You know, many things could be, hal we are trying to look at things from the glasses of halal and haram, mm -hmm. you know. And we are thinking that we are very religious mm -hmm. because we are trying to look from it, whether it being halal or haram. Mm -hmm. Well, on the 8th of Muharram, mm -hmm. is it halal to have a nikah? Mm -hmm. Well, it's halal, it's mm -hmm. not, it's, yes. you know, it's not haram, right. you can have a nikah on right. the, you know, aqd on the mm -hmm. 8th of Muharram marriage, have a marriage on the 8th of Muharram. But this is not adab. Mm -hmm. This is against adab. Right against the man right. of a person who's a lover of a Hilibay. Right. So we are kind of becoming too obsessed with the terminologies of halal and haram mm. and kind of overlooking the aspect of adab mm. that is there, the aspect of manner, right. which we have to install this mm. in us and in our society, in our children. You know, you go to a majlis, this is how you sit. Mm -hmm. This is how you carry yourself. This is what you do. Well, is it halal or haram? Well, you know, you're sitting in a majlis with a phone on and you know, right. I'm not doing something haram. Right. Yeah, right. I know I'm reading the Quran or I'm reading, yeah. 
you know, some essay which is very important. But this Baba Manjali, no, a speaker is speaking, yeah. it's against the other. Right. Well, is it halal? Well, yes, halal, right. you can do it. A very interesting you know. thing I, I've seen. Um, you know, you go to a Christian church on a Sunday morning, and uh, you'd find people bringing their children there, and the children are all well behaved, quiet, sitting down, paying attention. You go to one of our majalis, and somebody's giving a speech, and people bring their children. Not only are the children talking, but the people are talking. You see? Right. And at the same time, we want to say that Muslims are better than, than the non-Muslims, etc., etc. Right? Well, yeah, I'm so sorry. But what you have is better, but you are not actually better than them. Yeah, that's a good point. What you have is better. You know? Right, right. Yeah, so this adab, like as you said, Abu al-Fazl Abbas, I mean, he taught not just, you know, he taught the adab, you know, the manner mm. to behave in front of the imam, in front of, you know, the Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam. Mm. Yeah. Now, as they say that historically speaking, you know, uh, he basically uh, was uh, an orphan or his father died, Amir al -Mumineen. Death takes place at the age of 14. He was only 14 years old um, when the Shahadat of Amir al mumin takes place. Then 10 years he was with um, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, you know, alongside with Imam Hassan. And then after when he was 24, from 24 years till 35, as he reaches, that's the Karbala takes place. So he was 35 years old in the plains of Karbala, you know, that youth, mm -hmm. you know, that young age, you know, in regards to that. So I think we try to cover his personality from the Irfani, you know, Marifati, mm -hmm. from the knowledge and understanding point of view, a little bit of his historical background, his brothers, his mother, and and um, you know, uh, and also some of these examples that we could take. Mm. So, anything that you would like to share, uh, last point with our viewers that you would like to tell, uh, Sheikh? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that uh, you know we have to be able to treat these individuals uh, as if they are alive because they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, yeah, shahada are alive. Yes, yes, yeah. um, and especially at their height, spiritual height they can give us spiritual guidance from where they are. Yes. You know. Yes. Um, and I think we, are, we should, most of us, all of us, should try to access them even more so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, call upon them, you know, and they will be there to help us in, in getting, um, you know, close to Allah Inshallah. and to Inshallah. arrive at spiritual realization. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, to all our viewers. And let this gathering, this session, you're sitting and watching and Sheikh coming here, our brothers who are here to really uh, make this program reach you, you know, be a source of, of attention of Abu al-Fazl Abbas uh, to us and to our services that we are trying to provide. And in return, we uh, achieve and reach, uh, you know, uh, our potential uh, in realizing uh, our place uh, in the creation uh, particularly uh, in relation to the Vilayat of Ahli Bayt Ali Musalam. Uh, thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again next time. Ghafar uh, lana wa lakum wa salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.